Good evening, everybody. My name is Keithio Mwanzia, and I'm the President and CEO of the Guelph Chamber of Commerce. I will be your moderator this evening. I'd like to welcome all of you to this debate and thank you for participating in this, pro in this process. Before we begin, I'm going to review the format for this evening. Uh, the position and order in which candidates are seated and the position and order in which candidates will speak tonight were determined by a draw to, prior to the program. Candidates will be introduced in order in which they have drew, they've drawn their forms. Each candidate will be allowed three minutes for opening remarks, inclusive of any introductory or endorsement from anyone else. Candidates will be able to monitor their time on their screens in front of them in the room. Each candidate will be cut off at the three minute mark. The candidates will have an opportunity to answer all questions asked. Candidates will each be given one minute to answer the question and you'll be able to monitor your time on the screen in front of you. The order will be determined by the moderator on a rotating basis. The questions asked tonight will come from members of the Chamber of Commerce as well as from the audience here with us this evening. The opportunity for a rebuttal is limited to one minute and will be provided after all candidates have responded to the question under the following circumstances. Rebuttals will not be allowed based on comments made during opening and closing remarks. Quest a request for a rebuttal will be signaled to the moderator by placing your rebuttal card on the table in front of you. The number of rebuttals on any topic will be at the discretion of the moderator. The decision of the moderator will be final. Lastly, each candidate will be given the opportunity for closing statements. The candidate's order will be reverse from their introductions at the beginning of the evening. Closing remarks will be limited to 15, so excuse me, to one minute and, five, and 50 seconds in length, <laughs> 1.5 minutes, <laughs> 15 minutes. I know the candidates would love that. Um, and, and once again, the time will be displayed in front of you. Uh, as I said to the audience prior to us starting, uh, we want to be respectful and have a thorough and deep debate. I would ask that the candidates uh, respect uh, those same rules, as I know you will, as uh, proud Guelphites, uh, but also have fun. This is an, an exciting opportunity for you to discuss the issues with the Guelph community in a meaningful way. We are live streamed and we are live on Rogers TV. And so this uh, debate will be broadcast throughout our community. Now, without further ado, let's move to opening statements. Uh, and uh, as per the order that was drawn by the candidates prior, we will start with Agnieszka Milanaz for opening statements of three minutes. Hello. OK, great. Uh, before I begin, I want to acknowledge that we are currently situated upon the traditional territories of the Hananashe, Ojibwe, Chippewa, Anishinaabe, and Attawadaram peoples. That in recognition of the enduring presence of indigenous people, the Haldeman Track Treaty, and the history of First Nations, we are obligated and have much work ahead of us to fulfill the 94 calls to action as set out in the Truth and Reconciliation Report. Friends, we are a proud city, a city compromising of many hardworking, talented, and dedicated individuals, ones who have not been shy to success, hear a Juno, Emmy, and Nobel Prize come to mind. And we are proud because we recognize success as a product of a supportive community, a value reflected in the Chamber of Commerce, and I wish to thank our moderator, Keithio, and members of the chamber for not only hosting this debate, but bringing together and supporting strong partnerships between advocates, manufacturers, food and agriculture, innovation, technology, big data, and of course, small business. It is the job of government at all levels to provide the necessary support for communities to thrive. And for the next hour and change, I hope you will come to see me Andrea Horvath and the NDP as the partner to this community. Because we understand all of Ontario, including Guelph, has felt the squeeze. And this is why we are committed to making life in Ontario more affordable. This is why we are committed to good, safe jobs, 
lowering hydro bills, tackling the crisis of hallway health care, and providing affordable child care and a safe and healthy education all the way up to post-secondary. The NDP will be a partner to this city in addressing these concerns, and I look forward to demonstrating that our commitment to Ontario will benefit the city of Guelph as well. It will benefit our manufacturing sector, agribusiness, local business, the innovation corridor, and of course residents. We are the party that will deliver on all day two-way go, partner with colleges and universities to create 27,000 new jobs or new placements for graduates, and champion Ontario manufacturers in ongoing international trade negotiations. And no, it's not the middle class that will get a tax hike and, if, and be footed with the bill. It's time for the wealthiest corporations to pay their fair share in building a better and more affordable Ontario. We will protect the middle class from tax hikes and tax increases and fee increases. We will make financially sustainable investments and stop the 20 year practice of budgets and freezing that the Conservatives and Liberals have participated in. It is time for a change in Ontario, a change for the better, a change to help build a better Guelph today for tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Agnieszka. Uh, next to Sly Castaldi. Good evening, folks. I want to thank the Chamber of Commerce for sponsoring this event, the City of Guelph for, uh, City Hall for hosting us, and my fellow candidates here tonight. Putting yourself up for public office isn't an easy task, and so I have deep respect for my fellow candidates for answering the call. I want to also thank all of you for coming out and participating in the democratic process. And I thought I would spend my opening remarks letting you know who I am, how I work, and why I'm running. We're asking for all your support. I think it's only fair that you get to know us a bit. I've been with Women in Crisis for the last 28 years, serving as the executive director for the last 14. During my time at Women in Crisis, I have been able to build a strong organization that is unfortunately having have it had to grow consistently through the years. I've also been an integral part of building our other community organizations in town that serve vulnerable populations. I have been a strong voice at, the, at a provincial level working to bring about systemic change. During the last three years, I've had the privilege of being the co-chair of the Premier's Roundtable on Violence Against Women. In my role, I was advising government on many issues and I was a part of creating public policy. I had a front row seat at Queen's Park and I was able to see the kind of change that I could only have imagined. It was some of my best work. It was during this time that I wanted to become a part of something bigger. I did not wake up one day and decide to become a politician, but rather I understood the impact that public service can have on the lives of people. This is what motivated me to step out into the public and want to serve. I'm hardwired to want to help people and create sol solid public policies rooted in community work. I believe that good public policy is created through solid consultation. I believe that opposing voices are essential in creating plans that consistently keep us moving forward. And I believe that communities know what, wor knows, know what works best for them. I love Guelph, and I want to make sure that we continue to grow and thrive and remain a strong place to live, work, and raise a family. My fundamental belief is that public service is a calling and that we need to work together, and that the job of government is to do things that we cannot do for ourselves. And I would be honored to work with you and for you, for the people of Guelph, and to bring about opportunity and fairness to all. Thank you. Thank you, Sly. Mike Schreiner. I want to thank the Chamber for hosting tonight's debate, Keith Yeo for moderating it, I'd also like to thank my fellow candidates for being here, the audience in the gallery, as well as those of you watching at home. I'd also like to acknowledge that there are other candidates running in this election, and that I hope to create opportunities where your voices can be heard as well, so we can all work together for a better Guelph.
I'd like to thank Aggie for the land acknowledgement uh, in her opening comments and just uh, add to that that I believe now more than ever we need an Indigenous worldview as we think about the decisions we make today and how we can learn from the previous seven generations and how our decisions will affect the next seven generations. I've knocked on so many doors in Guelph and I've had so many voters tell me that they feel stuck. They're not happy with the three status quo parties. They've told me especially they're not happy with the establishment party that's been governing Ontario for the last 15 years, but they're not sure that they can trust the other establishment party that's had trouble governing itself over the last three months. And they want something different. And I can tell you the Toronto Star this week said, Guelph, you don't have to be stuck. And so I hope you vote for what you believe in. And regardless of who you vote for, I hope you vote for an MPP that's honest, operates with integrity, and will work hard for Guelph. I believe an MPP should listen to their community. And I have listened to the people of Guelph. And I pledge to be your voice at Queen's Park, not some leader's voice relaying a message back to Queen's Park to Guelph, from Queen's Park to Guelph. Some people have asked me, Mike, if we vote for you, what can one Green MPP do? Well, I think one Green MPP can change politics fundamentally in this province to make it about people. I've already shown people what I can do by working together with other parties. I got all four parties to work together to get big money out of politics in 2016. In the last election, I was able to get all four parties to actually stand in this building and speak out to protect Guelph's water from the Dole Lime Quarry. And it's that effort of collaboration, of bringing our community together, not to bicker among political leaders is what you see at Queen's Park, but to talk about how we together can build up Ontario and build up this community. So I will be a champion for Guelph, and I believe that our program to create jobs that put people and planet first will work for Guelph. And so I want to go to Queen's Park and be your voice, and I hope I can earn your vote, earn your respect, and earn your trust for June 7th. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Wow, that is mathematically timed. Um, <laughs> Ray Ferraro, introductory remarks. Hi, thank you. Uh, for the people who don't know me, um, I'll give you a short history. I was born in Guelph. I was uh, a council member for three years with the Cape Quarry group year, a few years back. I spent 10 years with the uh, College of Podiatrists and Foot Doctors. I was on their board of directors. The, uh, the city part gave me a big insight into what the city needs and help from the provinces to make things work in Guelph. The 10 years on the health board taught me a lot about the internal strife with the health system, the fragmentation, and uh, it was a very interesting uh, exercise. For the last 35 years, I've been an agent f uh, for developers, really only one developer from Austria. The, uh, we did a lot of projects in Guelph, and during that 35 years, I dealt with pretty well every ministry of the, of, the, of the province, and there's 36 of them, and I also had a lot of connections with the city. I'm, I'm aware of the red tape. I know what's keeping industry out of our province, and uh, it's not pretty. So just a quick uh, item. With the, with the party system, Mike's the only guy that doesn't have to worry about the boss. We have, we have uh, the, P, the PCs have a, a priority of cleaning up the hydro mess, cutting taxes to zero for the people who make a minimum wage, uh, bringing back um, jobs to Ontario. And that's one of the key things that I'm very familiar with. We brought a couple uh, places, a couple firms into Guelph, like the Tim Hortons group. There are about 300 jobs in their central shipping department here. And we were on a time frame that if we didn't approve it in one day, they were going elsewhere. We approved it in one day. Now, there was other items which I won't mention because there are too many. But uh, also on the PCs, I have my own agenda for Guelph. I know Guelph, uh, we have a hospital, real problem with our hospitals. We have a problem with uh, 
low-cost housing and long-term beds. Now, the low-cost housing to me is very interesting because I've been in that business. I know the ramifications of it. And i have talking to different groups. I found if a person doesn't have a proper place to live, it, it can create a lot of social problems. So there is that fine line that I think is important that we address. Um, other than that, uh, it's I'm willing and and able to work on a regular basis. And I don't want to be your MPP. I want to be your representative. Thank you. Wonderful. OK, thank you for uh, those introductory remarks. We're going to move into the one minute question period that will have a uh, rebuttal opportunity. Uh, I have been advised by the control room that as you speak into your microphones, you don't have to lean directly into them. They are quite sensitive. So we're able to hear you as impassioned as you are from, uh, from behind your seats. OK, so we will begin the uh, one minute question portion. Um, and uh, the first question will go to Sly Castaldi. Um, and that question is, well, I mean, this question will go to everyone, but Sly will have the opportunity to answer this one first. How will your party address the skills mismatch? Um, I, I um, <clears throat> thank you for the question. I think the, uh, the uh, Liberal Party has a program uh, with the, uh, in high school, the skills trade, to um, get people graduated through that program so that they're able to uh, get into the workforce. So I, I think that that program is actually quite successful in that's been, that's been happening. And uh, I, uh, I think that uh, the uh, party is really committed to having a trained workforce. Thank you, Sly. Agnieszka, over to you. Uh, yes, we recognize that uh, this is a big barrier, the skills gap, particularly to youth employment, which is at an uh, unemployment at 11.2% rate in Ontario. Uh, we are hoping to lift freezes on colleges and universities to create 27,000 new uh, graduate placements as soon as you leave the workforce, and as well as putting in more money into the innovation, the Jobs and Innovation Prosperity Fund uh, to be able to continue to fund uh, these kinds of uh, problems that we ha we're seeing in the skills, uh, in the labor market for skills. Thank you. Thank you, Agnieszka. Ray, over to you. Yes, the, uh, we've talked about that at one of our seminars, and that's part of the program where we bring new industry in and work along with them for skills training. So we have a very comprehensive program, and we're working with the individuals of the, uh, of the, of the industries, and we're working with them to provide funding to allow them to train skills staff for their specific uses. Thank you, Ray. Mike, to close us out. Yeah, hey, Keith, yeah, I think one of the things that separates the Green Party from the other parties is how we look forward and not backwards. And so one of the things I think we have to acknowledge is that about 70% of the new jobs of the future, we don't even know what those jobs are yet. And so we have to make sure we train our young people to not only have the skills that employers need today, but also the critical thinking skills to adjust to a changing workforce and to make sure that we have the lifelong learning opportunities in place so people can retrain and reskill. Part of that is connecting young people in particular to our workforce. So that is why we're big supporters of expanding opportunities in co-op education, um, uh, apprenticeships, and, and especially working in the trades where we do have uh, skills gaps at the moment. And so it's that integrated approach that's forward thinking is how the Green Party would approach the skills gap. Thank you, Mike. Okay, moving on to the next question, having not received a signal for rebuttal, and again, mathematically timed uh, on your part, Mike. Um, this uh, question will go first to Ray Ferraro, uh, and that is one in five Ontarians can't afford private dental care. What steps would your party take to address this oral health care problem? Well, it, the, all of the, uh, all of the uh, promises and uh, benefits to people, there's one fundamental difference. The PCs want to give you the money to do what you want. The other parties want to take your money and then they'll subsidize you. That's quite a different. 
quite a difference. And the dental, the seniors, we have a, a senior dental program for seniors, obviously, but uh, I'm, I believe it's 75% of the uh, dental program. But it, I'm just trying to point out the fundamental difference of all of the promises. If you look at, uh, Doug Ford has a, a slogan about putting money in your pockets. And that basically means we're going to give you the breaks, we're going to give you the, the, the discounts, we're going to give you the l lower taxes, uh, no taxes for the, for the minimum income people, and you do what you want and you pick your own uh, dentists or your own doctors. Thank you, Ray. Uh, Mike, over to you. Do you need the question repeated? Uh, no, I'm good. So uh, my hope is, is we have an opportunity to talk about fiscal plans in a little bit because I would like to discuss that in a little bit more detail, but I'll stay to this particular question. So the Green Party um, supports the expansion of dental care as outlined in the provincial budget. We've costed that as part of our plan. We believe dental care is essential and every family should have access to high quality dental care. And I think it's particularly important for people who are more vulnerable and struggling in our communities to have access to high quality dental care because I know when I've talked to people, particularly those with low incomes, uh, who have the lived experience of struggling, they've told me that one of the biggest challenges is if you don't have good teeth, it is hard to get um, access to good employment. And so making sure that everyone has access to high quality dental care is essential and having a plan to pay for it is essential. Thank you, Mike. Um, Next, we will have uh, Agnieszka. Uh, we are proud to present the first universal dental uh, plan, dental care plan. Uh, I'm sure many of you have experienced uh, the pain in your wallet when you go in and you find out you do need a root canal or a cavity to be filled. There are four million Ontarians who live without benefits day to day. Uh, sometimes making difficult decisions between whether caring for their teeth or caring for their children's teeth, uh, how they're going to pay for that, and choosing to use a credit card to do so. Because of, given the job situation that we're in now, these precarious types of employment, uh, temporary positions, minimum wage, part-time jobs, we need to fill in the gap and we need to invest in our population and think forward on how to look after people in order to make Ontario more affordable to give people these opportunities and to not make them personally responsible to pay for things that sometimes can reach up to $1,500 just for one operation Thank you, to Agnieszka. stop pain. Thank you, Agnieszka. That's time. Sly, over to you. Um, <clears throat> our party has made huge investments in health care, and I understand the importance of dental care. I've, I've seen it firsthand from the populations, vulnerable populations that I have worked with. I think that, uh, um, I don't have it in my notes right now, the explicit investment that we're going to be making in dental care, but I know that health care is a primary concern of the party, and, um, and I think that um, um, the, 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 medic, the, the drugs and everything else that goes into the investments in health care, and I, I would fight to ensure that we come up with the best dental plan that we can afford. Thank you. Agnieszka, rebuttal for one minute. when government has, um, and I have looked over at your plan, and it's $400 for individuals, $600 for couples, and $900 for families. And that is not only your dental plan, but also the drug coverage as well. And I can say from personal experience as someone who doesn't currently have benefits, $400 a year would only cover something like birth control, and that's, uh, that's it. It would not begin to cover any sort of dental expenses, and I've had a few in the last number of years. So I don't think that it's the plan to move forward. It's not as comprehensive as something Ontarians would need. Thank you. Um, Sly, I don't know if you're signaling that you want a rebuttal, but you, you have to signal with your, with your card. Okay. Uh, well, we will we'll move on to uh, the next subject matter. Um, kudos to Agnieszka for using her uh, rebuttal placard first. Mike, you're no longer the, the, uh, the lead in, in brownie points. Uh, this question will be addressed to you, Mike, to start, uh, but will be addressed to everybody else. Um, and the question is, what will you do to, to protect Guelph's water supply? 
Yeah, Keith, thank you. So um, this is an issue that's been near and dear to my heart, and I think we need to have both a principled approach to this issue and a scientific approach to this issue. So first of all, I think Ontario's permit to take water rules are broken. They don't prioritize water for communities uh, and people first. And I believe government has a sacred responsibility to manage water in the public trust as a public resource with everyone having a human right to access clean drinking water. I am particularly concerned about the fact that for over five years now, the city of Guelph has been in a battle with the province to place conditions on the water taking permit for the Dolime Quarry, which is a direct threat to the quantity and quality of Guelph's water. I have fought to protect our water. I have fought to support the city, uh, two council administrations now on this issue, and I will continue to fight. I have delivered almost 10,000 postcards to the Minister you, of the Mike. Environment on this issue. That is time on that question, Mike. Um, we will move to slide. Um, as I said in the social justice debate, I will do whatever I can to protect the quality and quantity of our water. Currently, Ontario has some of the strongest water taking protections in Canada, and currently there is a study uh, underway through the Grand River um, uh, Conservation Authority to look at the uh, study of the water protection, and so we're waiting to hear the results of that. There is a moratorium on new bottled water facilities and we're at increasing the fees for taking the water. I think that this is a really heated issue in our community. I think it's a complicated issue in our community. And, but I wanna be really clear, protecting the quality and quantity of the water is important. It's important to me, it's important to this community. It, also, it's important that we represent all of our constituencies. And so we need to get involved in conversations and move forward. Thank you, Sly. Uh, over to you, Ray. Yes, the, uh, we've addressed this before. The water taking, uh, the dole lime is quite an interesting thing. Neither, neither dole lime or the Nestle water taking are in the city, but the water table for Guelph is very close to it. And my, my answer on this was for 15 years, the existing Liberal government has, has probably rightly so uh, done all of their hyd hydrological work and they're quite happy with uh, the uh, state of the wells and so on and so forth. And I'm sure that any government, particularly the PCs, would uh, any, any time they noticed a problem, the, the permit would be canceled. I've done a little research with, uh, out there and they've had no, uh, no problems for 15 years. They have an insurance policy for people whose wells might go dry and they also employ 300 people. Now those are all sidebars because obviously it's a, it's a no-brainer. If there was a problem with the water, it would be addressed quickly. But so far, there has not been. Thank you, Ray. And uh, over to you, Agnieszka. We believe, first and foremost, that water is a public trust and communities' needs need to be put forward before any private interests. So, of course, we will be looking over the expired permits at the beginning of January and making a decision based on community needs on whether or not, to, and, and to begin to that transition to end uh, private, private water taking. Uh, this is how we have put forward our water strategy. We're very proud of it. It is something that we worked on with local community organizers in Guelph. Wellington Water Watchers did sit at the table with Andrea Horvath to help us develop our water strategy because we do believe moving forward and building healthy and safe communities, we need to prioritize issues such as water and how, how our unique population will grow in the next 10 years and how our water systems will be affected by that. Thank you, Agnieszka. Okay, we will move, oh, uh, I see a rebuttal, one minute rebuttal from Mike. So I think that a lot of people know my position on bottled water, but I think an issue that doesn't get discussed enough in the community is the fact that two city councils now, both led by Mayor Farbridge and Mayor Guthrie, has gone to the province and asked for very simple conditions to be placed on the water taking permit for the Dolime Quarry. They haven't even asked for it to be shut down. They've asked for a monitoring plan to be put in place, to, a management plan to be put in place, a monitoring plan to be put in place, that the quarry not um, take additional water, and that if there is any damage to Guelph's water, the quarry would be on the hook, not the city of Guelph. And for five years now, 
This has been in negotiation at the Liberal Ministry of the Environment. And I'm just curious, if any of the establishment parties, if you are in power, are you going to put an end to this and actually put conditions on the quarry's water taking permit? Okay, uh, thank you, Mike. Rebuttal, one minute from Agnieszka. Uh, we do recognize this is an issue, and we're also disappointed in the two parties, the Liberals and the Conservative, for how much they've let the Environmental Bill of Rights fall behind. It has been needed to be updated for years now, and we are well aware of this. There are too many loopholes and too many advantages in which situations like the Dolan Quarry can take place. A lot of this is how much we have, um, how much provinces have put on the shoulders of municipalities, and how much of their funding they have cut as well. Um, so, in this case, we do believe that. We need to not only update the Environmental Bill of Rights, but also better work with our municipalities to help support them uh, in being protected against such private interests. Okay, thank you, Agnieszka. We will move on to our next question. Um, <clears throat> and uh, for that, uh, actually, Agnieszka, you will be the first one to answer this one, but. Um, so we'll start with, there is a shortage of affordable housing, both rental and home ownership for middle to low income earners. What strategies do you support to increase affordable housing in Guelph? The first step we want to take is give that one third of funding uh, to help to begin and repair the social housing that we have so it isn't under threat of becoming acquired by private interests. Uh, the next thing we hope to do is to match with the federal government to begin the project of building 20,000 new units. And in addition, over the next 10 years, we hope to build 45,000 more as well for a total of 65,000 units. We recognize there is a shortage of housing, not only affordable, but supportive as well for individuals who are recovering uh, from addiction or mental illness who do need that help and need that safe housing to go to. Uh, furthermore, we also believe that we need to protect renters' rights and agreement and give tenants the power to be able to see and negotiate uh, where rents have increased and why they have done so. Uh, with these initiations, we do hope that we can begin to address the housing, affordable housing crisis in Ontario. Thank you, Agnieszka. Sly, next, over to you. Um, <clears throat> this is an issue I'm really passionate about because I, I know firsthand how hard it is to find affordable housing in, in this community. And as Aggie has mentioned, we need affordable housing, we need geared to income housing, we need low income housing, and we need supportive housing. The Liberals have the Fair Housing Plan and, um, and currently they put in measures to uh, uh, temper the crazy housing um, the prices that were going nuts in our in our province, and um, and uh, they've put in protection to stabilize um, uh, to take care of renters through Tenants Act, and they also worked hard to uh, put in a standard lease to pr to to protect tenants, and they also put in the uh, uh, the uh, what am I, more words are uh, they put in the um, uh, rent controls in place in which the uh, uh, the PCs are... Thank you, Sly. <laughs> that is time. That is time. Um, you know, uh, feel free to, to use your rebuttal card. Over to you, Mike, for the same question. Yeah, I will fight hard and work hard to ensure that everyone in Guelph has a place they can afford to call home. The Green Party has a three-point plan to increase housing affordability for Guelph. The first one being is let's follow international best practices with inclusionary home laws. Essentially what it is is any new development, whether it's rental, subdivision, townhouse, condo, would have a minimum 20% uh, below market affordable housing units. So I think of the Claire Baltby development that will be going forward. What if, imagine, 20% of that was affordable units. So that would Im increase the supply of affordable housing, particularly for young families just getting started and for seniors trying to afford to have a place to call home. Secondly, we would invest over $200 million in supportive housing, shelters, co-op housing, and social housing to make sure that we have the housing first strategy for our most vulnerable. That's time, Mike. And we'll get to the third. What happened, what happened to that math that you were so famous for? 
Ag Agnieszka, before we go to your rebuttal, we're going to go to uh, Ray, and then we'll swing back to you for your rebuttal. Ray. Yes, this has been my business for 35 years. The problem with Guelph is we have a, a, a shortage of a supply and demand. Uh, the land has gone ridiculous, uh, and this has been talked about, but Guelph has, hasn't had a, a, any, any type of large-scale uh, rental housing. Like we're for rental accommodations. Uh, we can't build and sell houses for the people, but we need, there's over 2,000 people registered right now in Guelph for a one-bedroom clean apartment. And the biggest problem I can tell you is not, is not the funding, although we haven't gotten anything directly because we're going through Wellington County uh, as the provider, but we have to address that. But the, with, there's a lot of land in Guelph that's owned by the province, and in conjunction with the city, we could, we could look at that land for building low-cost housing and get it done like next year without the red tape. Thank you, Ray. Rebuttal from Agnieszka. Well, first I would like to say that the city limits are the city limits and we can't exactly build outside of them. And the other, uh, the other point that I wanted to make is the NDP also has in their platform uh, the same mandate. They also wish that any new development to happen would also be 30% set aside for affordable housing. Rebuttal from Sly for one minute. Hi, I just wanted to finish my housing comments. <laughs> so so uh, I, I think that people have to understand that the housing crisis is a real crisis for a whole bunch of reasons, but it takes all three levels of government to work together to bring about solutions in this community. And I, can, I, and I know that this is something I'm incredibly passionate about, that I would work hard, because this is a, this is a priority for all of us. Okay, I see a rebuttal from Mike. Yeah, I just want to add my third point, and, uh, and, and I agree that all levels of government need to work together, which is exactly why I think we need to look at alternative solutions to better utilize our existing built environment so that um, we don't have to address affordable housing always by growing out and growing up. We can also utilize our existing building stock and built environment. And so, you know, what about tiny homes? I have so many people say you want tiny homes or co-housing, laneway housing, secondary suites, licensed basement apartments. There are many ways in which we can ramp up the supply of affordable housing for people using our existing built environment in Guelph. Thank you, Mike. Okay. <laughs> Ray, rebuttal. Yes, one of, the, one of the things I want to clarify, uh, it was mentioned that the city should put these clauses in their development agreements about percentages of low-cost rental housing. Well, they're already in there. They're never, they're never uh, uh, adhered to. This is the problem. Uh, what happens, the builder comes in and he says, oh yes, I'll put 10% or 20 at the end, but uh, I'll build the other ones left, uh, uh, other ones first. And then he comes to that and he comes back and the city sometimes uh, bends and says, okay, forget about it. So it's not programmed properly. Okay, great. Well, we will move on to our next question. I don't see any more rebuttal plaques. Um, so this will go to Sly uh, to kick us off, and this will go to everybody, of course. Um, so if elected, how would you address the cost of uh, and regulatory burden that is negatively affecting our local businesses' ability to compete? Hi. Um, I think that uh, what I want to, I'm watching the time here, what I want to put forward here is this, that by all economic measures, I think that the province is doing well. We have the lowest unemployment. Ontario has led the G7 in, gro in economic growth for the last three years, and we have the lowest corporate tax rate. So I think that what, 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 the, what, what, the, what I would like to do if I was your MP, is to work with uh, small businesses to, to ensure that they continue to grow and thrive. And if this question is really about the $15 minimum wage, I support that because I think that if you work full time in this, in this province, you should be able to care for yourself and your family. And I think that the minimum wage increase helps to keep people uh, your, your job so that you're not having a revolving door through your, through, through your business. But I recognize that the Thank transition... You, Sly. Thank you, Sly. That is time. That is time. Um, our, this question goes to... Let's see, we started with Sly. Next goes to Mike. 
Well, first of all, I will be a champion for Guelph to be the North American leader in the clean economy. I think we have to leap into the future now and create those good clean economy jobs and build on the foundation we already have in Guelph. Over 8,000 small businesses operate in Guelph. It's considered the fourth best place to start a business in all of Canada. And I want to be the champion for small businesses as a longtime small business owner here. I feel like in Queen's Park, we have two parties of big business and one party of no business. And we actually need a party that supports small businesses, which is why we're the only party calling for providing immediate cash flow relief for our local businesses by lowering their payroll taxes by increasing the employer health tax exemption. I too support increasing the minimum wage. I think low wage workers should earn a living wage. And at the same time, if we're gonna build strong local economies, we have to make sure our local businesses can afford to pay those higher wages and create more jobs. Thank you, Mike. Agnieszka. Uh, we will not be increasing any taxes on small businesses. I want to clarify that. Um, as well, we hope to make businesses more competitive by lowering hydro bills. Hydro bills have skyrocketed by up to 300%. And with our plan to buy back Hydro One, we would see an immediate decrease by up to 15%, slowly working towards 30%. This would help offset the costs for small businesses and help make them more competitive. In addition, the NDP supports small business. We believe in uh, presenting procurement contracts and setting an example of leadership by mandating that our government offices do use small business to help us move forward, up to 33% of our products, and make those contracts with local locals uh, in order to help support and help them grow. Thank you. Thank you, Agnieszka. We will go to Ray before we jump to your rebuttal slide. Ray? Yes, uh, I've been, the last three weeks, I've been called to a lot of offices, a lot of factories, a lot of concerned people, and uh, it's not, pretty out there. The minimum wage uh, is no problem at $14, but what, they, what the government did is they put all of the benefits in with it as if it was a full-time job, uh, which amount to about 15% in additional to the uh, $2. We have, the PCs have no problem with the $2, but we have a real problem with what they've done in wiping out the, uh, a lot of people just want part-time jobs. We've had restaurants that put up for sale. We've had uh, uh, people saying, uh, uh, per, the one that really hurt me was the uh, handicapped kids. They, they are literally wiped out. They're under a directive now that they must pay all of their volunteers a minimum wage of $14 plus all of the benefits. So this is not, it sounds very nice, but this is anti-establishment for small businesses. Thank you, Ray. We will go to Sly for first rebuttal, then Agnieszka. Thank you. I I have my notes in front of me, folks, and I could read you all of the investments that we've made for small business, and they are a lot. In fact, perhaps we should have all written out essays about our party platforms ahead of time so that you guys could have all had it. The question is that there is support for small business because we understand that that is the backbone of our economy. And we need small businesses to thrive because it's, if we remain prosperous, then we can invest in programs, and that's our commitment. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Agnieszka, rebuttal for one minute. We also recognize that with how uh, the economy is growing, there's over one million self-employed individuals. And these individuals deserve to have access to benefits that are affordable for them and maybe the few employees that they hire, or if they are just alone. We want to make sure that these people are supported, that they don't bear the burden of cost. And in addition, I am disappointed in the Conservative Party for wanting to leave lean back on minimum wage, cut back by one dollar, and, and say that they're going to cut income tax and support in that way. Well, Ray, how are people supposed to pay for benefits? How are people supposed to look after themselves when your income tax will give them less money in their pockets than the full $15 an hour? Okay. Thank you. I, I, obviously, Ray, I'm sure you want to respond to that. Let's, let's go with a rebuttal from Ray. <laughs> Well, I, uh, I, I object to the fact that you're tying in uh, the two, uh, the, the, you're, tie, you're tying in jobs with uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the minimum wage. That's not really correct. The, we're, not, we're not arguing about the minimum wage, but when the government comes along and says, all of you people with the handicapped children and all that, you cannot function anymore because you've got to pay 15% benefits and 
$14 an hour. I've got companies calling me. I've seen them, and they're saying, we're really out of business because we can't, we can't support everything at the moment. And really, it's, uh, when you look at, uh, uh, I get a little tired of all small businesses. Well, what is wrong with big businesses bringing in big jobs and, and helping our economy and lowering your house taxes by assessment for, in, for large businesses? Okay, thank you, Ray. Uh, is that a rebuttal I see from you, Mike? Yeah. Rebuttal, Mike, final one. Yeah, so first of all, you know, both the Liberals and Conservatives have said we'll support small businesses in this by lowering their corporate taxes. Well, that doesn't provide immediate cash flow relief for small businesses. So if you want to support small businesses, lowering their payroll taxes, which focuses on their job creation. So if you create more business, more jobs at, at a better wage, that's how you maximize your benefit, not necessarily maximizing your profit. And then I would just ask about the NDP platform, because I've been told that the changes to the business education tax is about a 28% increase on small businesses. And I've also been told that the lowering of the EHT exemption level would actually be a tax on a number of small businesses, because even a business like the size of the Woolly would be considered a big business now under that proposal, and that seems like a pretty small business to me. So I just wanted to clarify around the not increasing taxes on small businesses. Okay, well, we are going to move on. There'll be lots of opportunity for a uh, response on that. Um, uh, we have lots of questions today that we want to be able to get through. Uh, and Mike, we're starting our next question with you. <clears throat> what actions will you and your party take to respond to the escalating impacts of mental health and addictions in our community? It's a huge issue, and I think it's time that we treat mental health and addictions as a health care problem and a health care challenge and make mental health and addictions fully integrated into our publicly funded health care system. That's why the Green Party is proposing an historic $4.1 billion investment in mental health and addiction services over the next four years, which is $2.1 billion, or sorry, $2 billion more than the $2.1 billion investment that the Liberals have made in the most recent budget. I also think it's especially important to create a, an umbrella organization, like a super umbrella organization within the Ministry of Health that's dedicated to mental health and addictions so we can ensure that we have the resources and the government focus on addressing mental health issues um, because it's unacceptable that 12,000 children are on a wait list to access the health care services they need for mental health. Thank you, Mike. Ray, over to you. The, we're, uh, the PC party has been very forward about uh, the, the shambles of our health care uh, state, and that includes mental health. We're looking at hiring more doctors and nurses. The frontline people are not being supported enough. We have more bureaucrats in the health business than we have uh, health givers, fr frontline people. So we've got, a, I think it's $3.9 billion the, for both, both the uh, medical improvements and the mental health. So we're looking at it as, as one issue. Like, for instance, in Guelph, um, the Homewood Health Center at one time, you know, was a very good uh, provider for mental health. I'm not sure what the situation is now, but we're going to look at that. And, but all of these things, these are urgent. These are not things that can take red tape and forming committees. They have to be done quickly. Thank you, Ray. Sly, over to you. I think Mike's already answered our question around our investment in mental health, but what I can tell you this is that um, we have a good record in terms of when we invest in, uh, in, uh, in our health care system, and I believe, like Mike has suggested, that mental health, is, mental health and addictions are issues that are plaguing most of our communities, and wealth would be no different. And so what I would do is I would work with the community Canadian Mental Health Association and our community care health center that do most of the frontline services in this community in terms of mental health and fight hard to get them more investments in mental health because I think that this is something that you know we all need to we all need to work together to uh, to bring about some positive results for people who are suffering. Great. Over to you, Agnieszka. 
Uh, I do want to thank the work of Noah Irvine for bringing this, especially to our community, uh, how important this situation is and how dire it is. Uh, currently, there are 11 ministries who look after mental health and addictions. Uh, we believe that's too many, and we need to have one. Uh, one Ministry of Mental Health and Addiction Services. Uh, by putting our resources together, uh, in doing so, we will be able to better address the issue. Uh, in addition, we recognize that there needs to be more supportive housing, and I know this came up before, but when somebody needs help now, they need to be able to access it as soon as possible to begin, to begin treatment to get better. Uh, we also recognize that there isn't enough front, front mental health line workers, that kids are waiting too long, and we don't want them to wait for more than 30 days to receive assessment or begin the process of treatment. Okay, thank you, Agnieszka. Okay, we will move on to our next question. And uh, for this, we will start with you, Ray, uh, answering this question, and of course, this will be addressed to everyone as well. What is your position on amalgamating the public and Catholic school boards? That is something that uh, I don't think uh, the, the PCs are looking at it right now. We're looking at efficiencies. We've, they've had discussions with the two. There is some commonality between their purchasing and hiring. But that particular, that's a, almost like a church and state item. But that, that is something that would have to be looked into. Um, it's, um, it's there by act. And... Uh, it's a very contentious issue in some places, but uh, I think at the moment I'd have to say we'd have to have a really good conversation on that one. Okay, thank you. Over to you, Mike. Same question. First of all, I want to be very clear that the Green Party's number one priority in education is, refund, is reforming the education funding formula, which is broken. It was brought in by the Harris government, and it's never been fixed by the Liberal government. And so as a result, we are not receiving the kinds of funding we need in our classrooms, particularly supporting uh, students with special needs. Uh, we don't have enough guidance counselors, we don't have educational support staff, we don't have enough ECEs in our classrooms to service those students. I do think it is time for us to have a respectful conversation about how we can take the best of the separate school board in the best of the public school board and have our communities unified so that we can end duplication in a way that maximizes investments in our children's classrooms so we have the best quality okay, thank education. Thank you, Mike. That is time on that question. Uh, next, we will move to Sly. Thank you. I want to be really clear. I am a product of the Catholic school system and the Liberals have absolutely no plan to uh, amalgamate the two systems. I think the Liberals have made record investments in education and it, for example, what that means for Guelph is they've built 12 new schools and a new high school is coming since the Liberals have been in power. And let me also say that it took a long time to dig ourselves out from under the cuts that Harris had put in around education. So be very clear. I support the two systems. Thank you. Thank you, Sly. Agnieszka. Uh, New Democrats believe that our immediate priority must be on addressing uh, the critical issues in our education system uh, that require the most urgent attention, and that is tackling the repair uh, backlog of $16 billion and fixing the funding formula. Uh, as a result, we do, not, we do not have plans to move towards a single publicly funded system. We believe that there is so much more right now at a critical and dire situation that needs to be addressed. And throwing that, funding for, throwing that separate school system into the air and mixing it up is not the best strategy to move forward. And frankly, Mike, I am kind of surprised because your platform is quite clear in your intentions on doing so. Thank you, Agnieszka. Okay, uh, I don't see any rebuttal signs. We'll move on to our next question. Uh, actually, we will start this question with you, Agnieszka. Uh, and that is, do you support political campaign reform, including considerations about proportional representation and campaign finance? Yes, we do. <laughs> we do support electoral reform. Uh, we are looking forward to establishing a committee. 
on how to move forward with that in the best possible way. There are many different forms of proportional representation, and we wish to find the best one that uh, fulfills our needs uh, in the province of Ontario. In addition, we're also concerned with barriers to voting. Uh, we believe that we need to bring back enumeration uh, during the election process so that people know if they are registered, where they can vote, how they can vote, and how they can do so. Uh, finally, we believe that we need to begin these electoral forms even down to a municipal level, maybe allowing permanent residents to vote or looking into alternative systems of voting so that these processes of government can be more accessible for all citizens. Thank you, Agnieszka. Uh, next, we'll have Sly. Hi. Uh, I, uh, I, I support the, fin the campaign finance... Um, what did you call it, Keith? <laughs> so, uh, uh, um, political campaign reform, uh, which includes proportional representation as well as campaign finance reform. Uh, the campaign finance reform, I totally support. The proportional representation, it's my understanding that this was a ballot issue, I think, in 2003 or 2004, and the city of Guelph had uh, voted uh, against that, and so I don't see any reason to uh, raise it again. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mike, over to you. So one of my proudest accomplishments as leader of a political party was actually leading the charge to get big money out of politics. And many of you will probably remember a couple of years ago, we were having cash for access, fundraising events. Uh, ministers of the current government were having fundraising targets of $500,000 a year. And I felt that was uh, unacceptable and undemocratic and was able to work with Premier Wynne and Andrew Horvath and Patrick Brown, who was the leader of the Conservative Party at that time, and bring in legislation to ban corporate and union donations to political parties and lower donation limits from almost $33,000 a year per individual down to about 3600 I think we need to lower them further. I'm also a big supporter of proportional representation and take a lot of pride in the work I've done with Democracy Guelph on this issue because I think people in Guelph do want electoral reform, and they want their vote to count. That's what polling numbers have shown, and I will champion that for Guelph. Thank you, Mike. Ray, over to you. Well, the uh, financing changes were quite explicit this year, and I believe they're working. Uh, there's still some loose, very loose uh, programs. In other words, before the election is called, you can raise pretty well all the money you want if you have access to it. So that's a little unfair. But once the election starts, they're, they're very rigid. As far as proportional representation, I agree with Sly. That's been over the dam a few times, and uh, this is one of those issues that, as a representative, I would do what the majority of the people wanted. Thank you, Ray. Okay. Seeing no rebuttal cards up, we'll move on to our next question. Uh, and on this, we will begin with you, Mike. How will you support stronger regional transportation solutions in southwestern Ontario? So first of all, we need to be honest about how we're actually going to pay for transportation solutions. You know, for years, the three status quo parties have talked about building more transit, and we haven't built it fast enough to serve our communities. So I'm absolutely committed, first of all, to all-day two to, to all two-way GO service. We've been told it's coming. We've been told it's coming. It still hasn't come. In the meantime, I also think we need better intercity bus service. I talked to so many people in Guelph who asked me, why don't we have a direct GO bus to Kitchener-Waterloo or Hamilton, for instance, because so many people commute that way, and we could deliver that relatively quickly. In the long term, I do believe high-speed rail will be uh, an important solution, particularly through the um, innovation corridor, but let's build the GO trains and the bus service now because people can't wait 10, 20 years for high-speed rail. We need good transit now. Thank you, Mike. Back to that mathematical precision. Uh, we will move to you, Agnieszka. Uh, we fully support all day two-way GO. We recognize that it's not only needed for people who are commuting to Toronto uh, to get to a job, but also for those who have uh, specialty appointments to deal with uh, health care issues. Uh, to 
Kitchener as well, because they have the largest heart, heart uh, institution there as well. Uh, we do believe firmly in inner city transit. It's a big part of our southwestern platform, and we do want to see that happen, working with, of course, rural communities as well, so as not to overstep our boundaries and to as not disrupt uh, their processes of operation as well. Uh, in addition, we also believe and we're disappointed with uh, freezes to municipal funding costs, and we know that that has hurt transit users, specifically in Guelph as well. We want to increase that by 50% so that operating costs can be helped by the province, which is where it should be. Thank you, Agnieszka. Uh, Ray, over to you. Well, compared to what happened in the last 10 years, the last four years have been fantastic as far as intercity GO trains. Like myself, I do not drive into Toronto anymore. The GO trains are working very well and they're working as fast as they can. And I think it would, the, the government should be complimented on that because we've had more increases in that type of uh, availability than we've ever had. Now we've got the uh, highway from Kitchener and uh, I think that the, the infrastructure working with the cities is, is right on target. Thank you, Ray. We'll go to Sly before we move to your rebuttal. Agnesha, Sly. Um, I'm obsessed with high-speed rail, and I can't wait for it to come to Guelph. And our budget has committed more than $11 million to support the construction of Phase 1. This will not move fast enough for anybody, but it is in the plan, and the other parties have not mentioned it. So this is one of the things that we risk in Guelph as losing. And as someone who commutes to Toronto a fair bit, Spending two and a half hours on that 401 is horrifying, and it doesn't do us, any of us any good. So I, this is one thing that I want to make sure comes happen to Guelph. Thank you. Agnieszka, rebuttal for one minute. Well, first of all, I'm disappointed in Ray's answer. Uh, anyone who's used the all-way GO train to get to Toronto knows they go in at 7 in the morning, and they don't leave till 5. So if you have an appointment at 10, it's highly inconvenient for those individuals. Um, also, in our plan, we do have a commitment to high-speed rail, but we also want to investigate high-performance rail as well and uh, find out what the environmental impacts of either of those two systems would be for inner-city transit. Um, in addition... Uh, the, we, uh, sorry, I don't know how long the Liberals have been promising this, but now it's extended. It was supposed to happen, and now it's gone all the way to 2025, in which this commitment has been made. It simply feels like the Liberal government continues to pass the buck on this issue. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, we'll entertain a rebuttal from you, Sly. I think that the thing about the high-speed rail, and this is one of the things that I did learn through, uh, uh, through the past several weeks, is that we, never, we don't own all the tracks. And so we had to buy the parts of the tracks that we didn't own. And we're in negotiations. So, and it requires an environmental assessment in order for the trains to be uh, electrified, which they have to be for high-speed rail. Thank you. Great rebuttal, Mike. Yeah, so first of all, I distinctly remember running in the 2014 election, and we were told that we would have all-day two-way GO service by 2020 at the latest, which it's not going to happen. And I will respectfully disagree as somebody who commutes into Toronto to Queen's Park. When I have to come back in the afternoon, I have to get off at Mount Pleasant and catch a bus, and I'm actually charged extra for the inconvenience of having to switch from a train to a bus. And we cannot, like this I want to emphasize so much, High-speed rail, yes. And, you know, our mayor fought for Guelph to have a stop on that high-speed line. Yes, we need that, but we cannot allow high-speed rail to be an excuse not to deliver transit solutions tomorrow. I can't tell you how many families in Guelph I have talked to who are begging for a direct bus line to Kitchener-Waterloo and to um, Hamilton in particular. And we can deliver that tomorrow if we have the commitment to do it. Okay, uh, thank you, Mike. Rebuttal from you, Agnieszka. We need to open into these fair negotiations and open with good faith with CN, VIA, and GO to make this happen. Uh, the problem is the Liberals have not engaged and they have had 15 years to solve this problem. It seems like there's no resolution here between either of these three groups or between the government itself, and that's because these negotiations aren't being handled properly. And I'm excited to hear Horvath and F Catherine Fife from Waterloo has, have been working hard to make this happen, and this is one of the most stable parts of our southwestern platform. We want to see this come through. Okay. All right. Uh, seeing no more rebuttal plaques, we will move on to the next question. 
Uh, and it looks like we start with you, Aggie. Uh, excuse me, uh, Agnieszka. Um, and that is, what is your party's position uh, on supporting women in leadership positions? Will your party continue with the Ministry for the Status of Women? We are very proud to say we're the first major political party to feature 56% female candidates in this election. Uh, so yes, we are very supportive of having that representation happen. Uh, this is a complex issue on many different levels, addressing the gender pay gap. But from the perspective that I like to come at it is that we need to see more affordable childcare. Uh, women are usually the ones who are kept longest out of the workforce, and depending on what age you are when you leave, it can really affect a woman's career if she's taken out of it for two, three, sometimes four years, because it costs the amount of money of a small mortgage to put a small child through uh, childcare in this province. So I think we really need to address that there are not enough spaces, which can be problematic, but also how expensive it is. In addition, we're kind of over the pink tax, to be honest. Uh, it's something Andrea Horvath is very passionate about getting rid of. Why do we pay more for razors? Why do we pay more for feminine Thank products? You. Thank you, Agnieszka. Uh, we will go to you, Ray, for the next uh, answer. Yes, I hear all that, and uh, the 50... <laughs> the women, 56% uh, is nice. So the, uh, I think the PCs are, are about close to 50%. Here we're 50-50. Uh, uh, I think the women are well represented, and I'm very worried about the men. Okay. Mike, over to you. Uh, I, I can say as a man, we've been well represented for a long time. So uh, I certainly think we need more women in politics. We need more women in all uh, aspects of leadership positions throughout our society. And it's one of the things I love about the great work that Guelph does, and particularly uh, uh, supporting women entrepreneurs, but also women uh, political candidates. I'm proud to say, as the leader of the Green Party, uh, we have 52% women candidates. Uh, and so, you know, we didn't quite meet the 56% target the NDP uh, did, but I'm quite proud of that. And I just want to do something a little different in politics. Um, I actually want to compliment the Liberals on their work they've done, particularly on issues around uh, violence against women, around creating the ministry, uh, which we support, uh, and in especially the work I know Sly's done on this issue. And I think it's important to acknowledge um, you know, when we can disagree with other parties, but also when we can agree. Thank you, Mike. Over to you, Sly. Thank you. This is the one area where I feel really 100% solid, rock solid on. And I want to I, I, I wanna tell you that uh, being, being as um, co-chair of the Premier's Roundtable on Violence Against Women, there is no one Premier in the history of this province who has done more to support women and children than Premier Wynne. She, and that, so you've got that issue. Plus they have an ec a women's economic empowerment strategy, plus they have the child care plan. This, the Liberal government, in my opinion, the li we get uh, a, a, an A-plus in this particular area, and thanks for acknowledging that, Mike. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, not seeing any rebuttal plaques going up, we will move on to the next question, starting with you, Ray. How would you and your party address high electricity and energy costs to strengthen business competitiveness and reduce input costs for business? Well, that's a very topical uh, uh, item, as we all know. We've come on record as we are going to repurchase the 50, the 57, uh, 53 percent that was sold. Uh, that was a that was a, a, a real far far plan. We uh, Premier Wynne sold. She got nine billion dollars for a uh, 53 percent interest, and we don't know where the nine billion dollars went. But that particular item, we're starting to sell assets to try to make it work. So we are doing that. We are dropping the rate of hydro. Uh, we're going to get rid of the six million dollar men that are sitting around that table. And uh, we're, going to, we're going to really work at it because this is an ongoing problem and this is where we want to put the money back in the people's pockets, let them decide what they want to do it, not with what, uh, give more money to the, to the parties and, and spend it for you. Thank you, Ray. Sly, over to you. 
So I blew this question in the last debate, so I'm a little bit more uh, prepared. What I want to tell folks is this, honestly. I've been trying to, to, to catch up to speed on the, on the hydro thing, and hydro is a, it's a very complicated issue, and I know it's a very emotional issue, and I've been hearing it at the door over and over again. Hydro has been a mess because every party has had a hand in its messiness. So no one, no, you can't blame one particular party on this one. And after decades of neglect, it required some big infrastructure, and it required, and when we moved from coal to nuclear, that was going to be more, exp that was going to cost, that was going to cost some. So the fair, so the fair hydro plan is about reducing everybody's energy bill by 25% on average for families and small businesses and farms. Uh, Thank, th this you, Sly. Uh, Thank you, Sly. Thank you, Sly. We, who knows if we're entertaining rebuttals on the next round, but Agnieszka, over to you, uh, and, then, and then we'll entertain that rebuttal. The fact of the matter is the Liberals did sell it, and that was against 80% of Ontarians' wishes that they did do so. Um, and now they're suggesting on taking a second mortgage out to pay for it, and that's something that will definitely follow me for the rest of my life, so I'm against it. Ray, I'm so glad you're jumping on board with the NDB to buy back Hydro One. Thanks for taking our plan. I haven't seen your numbers, but our numbers are looking pretty good on that part. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is we do have a plan to reduce hydro rates by 30%. It will take about six years to f see the full 30, but we can guarantee the first 15 by getting rid of time of use uh, management. Uh, it's unfair and discriminates against people who live at home or who work night shifts, for example. And also, we want to see the removal of the HSD on hydro bills as well. We're going to help keep that cost down. And of course, with the cost down, it'll help small businesses as well with their overhead costs. Okay, great. We any other rebuttals other than Sly? I, haven't gone yet. I know that. Yes, oh. we, of course we want Mike. Oh, don't sure. you worry. I've got the math up here too. <laughs> Mike, over to you for a response. You know, first of all, we have to just start being honest with people about electricity prices. You know, hydro rates pro went up primarily because the Conservatives privatized the system and then froze the rates. And then when they unfroze the rates, they dramatically went up. So the Liberals are kind of doing the exact same thing with the unfair hydro plan, which is being supported by the NDP and the Conservatives. When you falsely lower uh, electricity prices without um, addressing the root causes of the problem, the problem's only going to get worse after the election, of course. We all know that. So we're the only party that has the courage to stand up to the nuclear lobby and say no. You are not going to raise our prices by 180% over the next decade to refinance the building of our nuclear plants. We would say yes to low-cost water power from Quebec at one-third of the price. And the billion dollars a year we would save, we would invest it in your home and your business so you can save money by saving energy. That Thank gets you, to the Mike. root of the problem. Thank you, Mike. First rebuttal from Sly, then we'll go to uh, Agnieszka. I just want to say for the record that um, while I appreciate that it might feel good to get rid of the $6 million man or to buy back hydro, that will not take any cents off your bill. It, it, that, that, ship, that ship has sailed. So for me, what we want is uh, clean, reliable power and, 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 and going, going nuclear what was that? And we no longer have smog days and asthma rates are going down. So this was a, 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 a decent plan. And I think Mike would appreciate no smog days. Thank you, Sly. Agnieszka, last rebuttal. I'm not sure what Mike means by the NDP supporting the other two parties on hydro. Uh, outside of that, now Ray supports our party on hydro. Uh, right now, the situation that we're in is we could use the dividends from the 30% that we have to buy back those stocks. They are low enough to begin this plan to move forward and do so. This is not us making up numbers. This is a costed plan that we have put forward and have run with for the last year. We've been totally transparent and open in how we are going to do so and directly showing how we are going to lower those bills. We're not making this up as we go along. We're passionate about this. We believe hydro is a public essential, and it's a public essential service that belongs back in the public's interest and needs to stop being private, and that is something that we can deliver on now. Okay. Uh, 
Ray, I see a rebuttal card from you. Mike, if that's a rebuttal card, we will, we will do rebuttals from both of you, and then we'll move on from the subject matters. I think both Sly and Agnieszka have had the opportunity. Let's, let's jump to Ray. Yes, I just wanted to comment on, on some of the uh, referrals. Not only has the hydro been out of, uh, out of control, that $6 million man and his board, who are making close to $200,000 each, they're, they're a privatization type of thing that went wild. They just spent $50 million to invest in some company called uh, Vista in the States. Now, I'm wondering, if you've got enough problems here, why are we investing in the States? And the $6 million man is just uh, a, 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 an item that he's going to get $10 million because he'll be, uh, he could be let go without cause. Well, the way he's running that, I think that's, with, I think that's cause. So I think that it's more than just the $6 million man. It's the whole hydro needs to be revamped from top to bottom, starting with buying it back. Okay, thank you, Ray. Mike? Yeah, it's definitely more than the $6 million man when we're on the verge of spending $13.8 billion to rebuild Darlington. If history is any indication, that's going to be $32 billion. And what I mean by the party supporting the unfair hydro plan, you know, this started with the NDP, well, it actually started with the Conservatives freezing rates. Then it started with the NDP saying, we're going to take 8% off of your electricity bills. And then the Liberals raised them and said, we're going to make it 25%. And the NDP raised them and said, we're going to make it 30%. And now the Conservatives said, we're going to raise it by an additional 12%. Because I feel like we're in this bidding war. At some point, is somebody just going to say, hey, we'll pay you to use electricity, instead of actually being honest with you about what it's going to take to solve the issue. And that is why the Green Party is getting at the root of the problem. And that is helping you save money by saving energy, not wasting billions on outdated technology and choosing low-cost, clean solutions. Thank you, Mike. OK, we will move on to our next question. Actually, we begin with you, Mike, this time around. Um, what is your position on the current sex ed curriculum? We support it. Um, I think our children need to learn about their bodies. They need to learn what healthy relationships are about. They need to learn that when consent has been violated, that how they act. They need to learn what sexual misconduct is and how to articulate that and how to go to their parents and their teachers, their spiritual leaders, or whoever they turn to for help. Um, I think it takes Ontario backwards for the Conservatives to get rid of it. Um, I do support every parent's right. If they want to pull their children out of um, sexual education classes, that's certainly their right to do that. But don't deny all the other children in Ontario the opportunity to learn about their bodies and healthy relationships with other people. Thank you, Mike. Agnieszka, over to you. Uh, we support it full-heartedly as well. Um, we also recognize that there need to be other supports put into schools, particularly within middle schools and high schools. Uh, it's an important time and transition for a lot of young people, learning about themselves, discovering new relationships. Um, and we need, feel that there needs to be more mental health workers available to students uh, straight out the door in school, more guidance counselors as well, to help them navigate through those difficult transitions and times. So in conjunction with the curriculum, we hope that these types of supports will keep uh, teenagers and young people health and safety in discovering themselves and their relationships. Thank you, Agnieszka. Sly, over to you. Um. I uh, support it a thousand percent. I think it was probably one of the best things that the Liberals did in terms of supporting education. I think that uh, the old curriculum was 15 years old. It was before Facebook, Snapchat, and everything else on the, uh, and the internet. And we need to give kids the tools and skills to navigate this complicated world. So, um, and I think that this was one of the most widely consulted curriculum ever done. Over 4,000 experts, parents, uh, all sorts of people had a, a say in it. So I am, I am really supportive of the sex ed curriculum. Ray, over to you. We're totally against it. This is not something that the teachers should teach my children or somebody's children. This is a parent's responsibility. It was not 
properly vented to the people. I've talked to a lot of people, and this, this is getting really weird where the government wants to take your children and raise them for you. But this particular one is really sensitive, and we are absolutely, if we get in, we will definitely withdraw it. Okay, I see a rebuttal card from you, Sly, for one minute. I don't understand why anybody would actually campaign on this particular issue. You have rape crisis centers across this province who see kids every day who are uh, victims of sexual, uh, sexual harassment and, and violence. And yes, I agree, kid, parents should be having this conversation, but they're not. And, and it is part of the health and phys ed curriculum, which is just like teaching your kids how to do math, science, and everything else. And I, I, I really don't understand why we would put kids in this province in jeopardy by not having this curriculum. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Ray, we'll give you the opportunity for a rebuttal as well. Yeah, just one other comment. Uh, I appreciate your uh, candor on that. But the, uh, if you go back, and the people we've talked to are definitely against it, and if you go back how this was, uh, the, the person that wrote this it was not a very stellar person in, the, in that whole uh, sex education language. And, uh, we're, you know, the, the people that we have heard do not want it. I'll just, I'll remind our audience, uh, you know, our, our initial uh, rules on decorum. Please no jeering, laughing, or uh, cheering of any of the comments. Let's go to you, Agnieszka, for last rebuttal. A lot of people wrote it, Ray. A lot of people were involved in writing it. Just as Sly mentioned, this was one of the most largest consulted curriculums. It wasn't just one person. And I... I, again, Sly asked me to rebut as well, and I agree with her because this is a serious issue. We need to be talking about sexual health and sexual education. Kids can get hurt. Uh, they cannot have the proper vocabulary that they need, to do, they, they need to have in order to explain how they're feeling, what's been done to them, how they can be supported, what crises, hotlines and outlets they can go to. When we're talking about mental health, this is also an issue that we need to address because it's deeply connected with that as well. So to move forward as a progressive society, we need to begin to talk about sex and sexuality more and to have that out in the open and to let individuals know that they are supported in the choices that they make as long as they are safe. Thank you, Agnieszka. Okay, seeing no more rebuttal plaques, we'll move on to our next question. Um, and we'll start with you, Sly, on this one. Uh, how do you plan to tackle ever-increasing needs, for instance, healthcare and education, while keeping in mind the growing deficit? That's a really that's a that's a, a really good question and one that I've been um, I've been thinking about uh, a fair bit, and I think the question for me becomes what do we do with our, when when times are good what do we do with our prosperity, and I think that that's the time where we invest in health care in education, and so that so that. Uh, People have what they need to take care of themselves and their families. Uh, you know, I, I I run an agency. I get the I get how hard it is to uh, to have a deficit. But I also know that there there comes a time sometimes where you have to go into debt to invest in needed services. And and I think that that's that's where we are in Ontario. And uh, and and it's hard and it's scary. But there is a thoughtful plan to pay it back. Thank you. Thank you, Sly. Uh, over to you, Ray. The uh, two top um, uh, pr programs are health and education, followed by social service and followed by debt. Debt is number four now. There's 31 ministries, and they're thinking of putting a ministry for debt and 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 money owed. The uh, I. Uh, I think the position of the PCs is quite clear. We're going to invest, along with the federal government, $3.9 billion in more frontline services, because particularly in Guelph, we need another hospital. We've grown over 35% capacity in our current one, and our providers need help. Education-wise, the education people are the only ones that have uh, designated monies coming from your taxes. They get a third of your taxes. They get indexed money from house building. I often wonder just how much money they need, and, but I'm sure that's a very important thing, and that's one thing we'll have to look at. Thank you, Ray. Over to you, Agnieszka. 
As Ontario stands right now, we believe that a deficit is necessary to make the proper investments to fix dire issues that are happening in this province now. We need to address the crisis of hallway hospital medicine. We need to address the $16 billion worth of repairs that our education system needs. And we need to address senior care as well. To do this, we have to make these investments now before the situation spirals out any further out of control. That's why we have a 10-year capital investment plan, because we also value the fact that we do need to pay back this money, that we can't live forever in a debt. But unfortunately, right now where we stand, after 15 years of mismanagement, and plus the Mike Harris years as well, these things are things that have simply caught up to us and will have to be addressed after this election. Thank you, Agnieszka. Mike. So I feel like this election campaign in 2018 feels like a fantasy land election. I mean, the promises on all sides without any fiscal plan of how to pay for it. So I look at the Conservatives. I think I've counted up now about, over the next four years, $20 billion in tax cuts and an additional $6 billion in spending plans. So there's a $26 billion hole there and no fiscal plan at all how to pay for it. So I would love to see some numbers. I agree with the Liberals and the NDP that we do need to make investments in good public services. But we also have to be honest with people about how to pay for it, because right now we're paying a billion dollars a month in interest payments. That's a billion dollars that can go to health care and education and better transit. And that's why we've put forward a fiscal plan that talks about ways to save money and ways to raise money so we can have a deficit one third of what the Liberals have proposed. OK, thank you, Mike. I see two rebuttal cards. I think yours went up first, Ray, and then we'll come to you, Agnieszka. Yes, just a correction, Agnes. You missed the five years of the uh, Bob Ray uh, Demo uh, NDP government. They contributed heavily to the current debt of $325 billion. Okay. Thank you, Ray. Agnieszka. I'm not going to comment on the actions of a liberal. Um, and uh, moving forward, since those years, the NDP has grown significantly as a party and has matured. We have a leader who has nine years of experience working in Queen's Park, and we do have a fiscally responsible platform. Our entire platform is costed. Yes, we made a $1.4 billion mistake. We miscalculated a, what we thought was a revenue to actually be a deficit. We have admitted to that problem. And we are open to do so because that is what good leadership does. They admit when they make a problem. But Mike, I do have questions for you because I'm not, I have your platform. Uh, I am aware that par parts of it are costed. You want to do things like implement universal dental care and pharma care plans, but you also say you want to create an integrated funding structure for healthcare based on quality outcomes that will ensure the best care is provided by the most appropriate and cost effective provider. In the last debate, you did say you were against harmful 3PPs, but at the same time, when I see most appropriate and cost-effective provider. You, Agnieszka, that is time. What does that mean? That is time. Uh, I see, of course, on the deficit question, that's an important one. Uh, is that, is that a, a rebuttal card for consideration? Yes. Okay. So let's, let's go Sly first on rebuttal, and then, and then we'll go to Mike, and then we'll close out the subject. Uh, um, so, you know, I, I, get the, I get the debt and the deficit, but I, I think also I would like to... Um, offer the perspective that by all economic measures, we are doing well in Ontario. We have the lowest unemployment. Ontario has led the G7s in economic growth for the past three years, and we have the lowest corporate tax rate in the country. By all measures, Ontario is doing well. It has not been mismanaged. It, and in fact, I think Premier Wynne has had has done a good job of taking a balanced approach to, this, to, to, to the needs and growth because we can't meet needs without prosperity. So we have that both in balance. Those things are both important. Thank you. Thank you, Sly. Mike, final rebuttal. Yeah, I, I'm just trying, I think I kind of am getting Aggie's um, accusation, but um, what we have done is we have listened to nurses we have listened to frontline healthcare providers, and they have told us that if we invest in publicly funded, publicly delivered primary healthcare reform, we can actually deliver better care for people at a lower cost. Almost half of emergency room visits in Ontario right now 
are people who could not provide a primary, could not access a primary health care provider. And out of desperation, they ended up in eMERGE. It would be so much more effective to care for those people with nurse practitioner-led clinics, um, family health teams, mental health supports, social work supports, physiotherapy supports. That's what integrated health care is public practitioners all working together to provide high quality care for our people in our community. Thank you, Mike. Okay, we will now move on from this subject matter. We'll start with you, Agnieszka. Uh, and uh, the question is, if elected, what steps would you take to improve wait times and services at Guelph General Hospital and other healthcare centers in the city? Uh, we would begin by lifting the funding freeze on hospitals and increasing funding by 5.3% immediately. Uh, we want to see the frontline hiring of 6,000 new nurses as well, and we will make available 2,000 beds now. Uh, this is an investment, uh, and we recognize that, but we feel that this is what is needed to begin to alleviate the situation. In terms of long-term long growth uh, to alleviate the situation of uh, too much hallway medicine, we want to invest in senior care, and we want to open a committee within the first 100 days when we form government to address the situation and see how fast we can move on it to begin to stop relying on hospitals and emergency services for that care. Thank you, Agnieszka. Uh, next, we will go to Mike. Yeah, we need a complete transformation of our healthcare system to make it one focused on preventing illness and promoting health in addition to just treating sickness. If you talk to you know, doctors like Ian Digby at Guelph General, uh, uh, frontline nurses, they will tell you that we need primary health care reform so people can access the quality care they need in our community. We need mental health care reform. I was talking, the reason the Green Party is putting such a huge investment in mental health is because people need those mental health supports in our community. I've talked to doctors at Guelph General and said, I almost know the names of most of the mental health patients because they just rotate through the emergency room and we're not equipped to care for them. That's why they should be cared for in our community. We need more long-term care beds and community care supports for people. We have a number of seniors in hospital who should be cared for in long-term care or community care. So that's how we Thank free you, up Mike. resources. Thank you. Uh, next, we will go to Sly. Thank you. Um, we're increasing our health care spending by 5% to reduce waste, waste, wait times and increasing access across the entire health care system by including $822 million to support Ontario's publicly funded hospitals and $2.1 billion over the next four years for mental health and addiction to deliver more accessible, integrated care. I am also very well aware that currently there is a proposal at, uh, for, uh, in from Guelph General Hospital to expand its emergency care to include a mental health emergency unit. And I think that that is something that is needed and will help with our own system here in Guelph. And I totally support making that happen. Thank you. Thank you, Sly. Ray, over to you. We've already, the PCs have already announced that they have hired a very distinguished doctor to look at our entire system quickly. Uh, the Guelph General Hospital is way undersized. We have not had any, uh, any extensions or proper plans for it in quite a while. Um, the 55% uh, of the health budget is going to bureaucrats, not to the frontline workers. We've talked to nurses, we've talked to doctors, and they're desperate. We intend to put something through very, very quickly. For to, to benefit. Thank you, Ray. Okay, not seeing any rebuttal plaques up, we'll move on to the next um, subject matter. And uh, we'll start with you, Sly. How will you ensure Guelph's infrastructure needs receive provincial support? I think that uh, the City of Guelph has done quite well through the funds access, through the uh, cap and trade money and uh, I think in this year alone they got almost three million dollars to support uh, bike lanes, transit, um, all sorts of projects. So I think that the money that the, that the city gets from the province's cap and trade program is, uh, is, doing, is doing fairly well as well 
the schools, the university, replacing boilers, windows, becoming more energy efficient. I think that uh, that's all been the result of the funds that they're able to access through cap and trade. Thank you. Thank you, Sly. Ray, over to you. This is a project that we've talked about quite often. Uh, the, you have to get a partnership between the province, uh, the representative, and the city. You have to work together. Infrastructure the city could never handle. It's too large a number. So there is a lot of room to work together and also bring in the federal government. You've got three different governments with their hand in your pocket. It's about time we got together and provided some efficiencies, and it can be done quickly. Thank you, Ray. Agnieszka, over to you. Um, municipalities are still paying dearly for when the Ontario Municipal Partnership Fund was frozen. And we recognize that funding needs to be unfrozen and it needs to be addressed in terms of unique needs of a community. Uh, the way that the population has grown, uh, in what services and care that they need to do so. Uh, that's why one of our initiatives is um, picking up the slack and giving back that 50% towards transit for operating costs because we recognize that provincially we do need to bear some of the burden of responsibility to see our municipalities function as well as possible. Um, and we real yes, sorry, that's all I had to say on that. <laughs> Thank you, Aggie. Uh, over to you, Mike. So as an MPP, I see one of my top jobs to be a champion for Guelph. And I've already been doing that. Um, I've met with ministers. I've written letters on behalf of the city of Guelph um, advocating for uh, infrastructure funding for things like li the library or the South End Rec Center. And so I will be a partner with city council in championing investments in good public services and good public infrastructure. I also believe the Green Party's plan will significantly support cities. So our thoughtful costed out program to invest more in transit infrastructure, to cover 50% of municipal transit costs, which is a huge expense to the city. Also, our um, rules that we want to bring in around the Waste Free Ontario Act to bring in an individual producer responsibility to put the burden on private companies that produce waste, because that's a huge responsibility. And finally, our affordable housing plan will help Guelph as well, because those are big expenses you, for Mike. the city. Not seeing any rebuttal cards up, we will move on to the next subject. And we'll start with you, Agnieszka. What will your party do to increase the number of licensed childcare spaces and make them more affordable? One in five children uh, aren't, uh, there. only one in five children are uh, receiving the affordable child care that they need. We recognize that this is a dire issue for many families. I have friends of my own who, as soon as they got pregnant, already put themselves on a waiting list uh, because it's so difficult to find a space. That's why we hope to see 202,000 new not-for-profit licensed child care centers. Uh, this is something that we see doing, increasing the space by 10% every year. We want to begin with offering care for infants and toddlers in our second year and moving into uh, preschoolers within our third. Uh, if you make less than $40,000 a year as a family, uh, we believe that childcare should be free and accessible. Otherwise than that, on a sliding scale with an average, depending on how much you earn, we want to make sure that healthcare is affordable at $12 a day. Thank you, Agnieszka. Uh, we will move next to Mike on this question. Yes, yeah, so our costed funding plan supports the almost billion dollar investment in affordable child care that's contained in the spring budget. Uh, we would take a different approach than the current government. Um, we think child care should be affordable across all ages instead of just being concentrated into one particular age group. We also have to listen to child care providers like the YMCA, which is the largest child care provider in Guelph, because they have said that we need to support those people and in, in organizations delivering child care as well. Otherwise, it might be affordable, but if there aren't enough spaces available, then people, then families still can't access those. The other thing we have to look at too is to make sure we support a range of options for parents. So I've met with a number of home care providers in Guelph who feel like the changes to the regulatory regime is hurting their ability to deliver affordable child Thank care. You, Mike. Okay, we'll move next to Sly. 
I see a rebuttal plaque up. We'll come to you. Next to slide. The Liberal government is making high quality licensed childcare free for pre preschoolers ages uh, two and a half to full day kindergarten st starting in 2020. And they're using the, we are using the same plan that they did to bring in about f um, full day kindergarten. Whereas you build the spaces, you train the staff so that you're ready to go just like full day kindergarten was. And it turned out to be a very good thing. I think that the difference between our plan and the other parties is that we support a clear, we support both not-for-profit and for-profit providers because here in the city of Guelph, we are a 50-50 split between not-for-profit providers and for-profit providers and the health, the child care providers who have met with me that said this plan works but supporting only not-for-profit does not work because we, we need more spaces and there's just not enough. And in some rural communities, that they only have a for-profit uh, child care provider. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Sly. Ray, over to you. Uh, the party has, has looked at the plan that was put forward and the key word was only registered or, li or registered uh, daycare centers. It didn't mean that the other ones were, were not safe. So what, what the PCs will do, they'll give you up to a 75% rebate uh, on child care expenses and you pick what, where you would like your child to go. That's quite a difference and we're ready to go with that. Okay. Thank you, Ray. Rebuttal from Agnieszka. We support the not-for-profit industry because we know it's registered, it's licensed, and they have high degrees of regulations. They work with ECEs to make sure that kids are as safe as possible. And I do have concerns with the Green Party platform. I have concerns when you suggest in your platform to allow business and give businesses incentives to open up their daycares. How would you license this? How would you regulate it? And also, I do get a little frustrated with the Liberal plan because I understand it's great uh, after two and a half years to have that year and a half of free child, child care. Uh, that's great, but there are families out there who can't afford to take extended maternity leave. And where does that leave them for that one year where it's incredibly expensive to put a child, care, to put a child into child care? Thank you, Agnieszka. Rebuttal for Mike? Yeah, I think we need to have a, oops, sorry, we need to have a bit of a, amalgamation of the best of what the NDP and the Liberals are proposing here. So first of all, um, there are many home care providers who provide quality licensed child care. They want to be licensed directly with the ministry. They want to be fully regulated. They want to, to um, provide safe care. And that is an option that works for some parents. We also need strong not-for-profit -for child care available in schools, at the Y, in places like uh, other public facilities. But I think we need, and this is what I actually like about the NDP proposal versus the Liberals, is, is that it needs to be affordable across all age groups instead of targeted at just one age group. So let's work together to develop the best plan that works for parents and children. Thank you, Mike. Okay. Not seeing... Any rebuttal plaques up on the subject, we'll move to the next one. And we will start with uh, Ray on this question. So as the tech corridor continues to develop between Toronto and Kitchener-Waterloo, um, or as I like to call it, the greater Guelph area, how, how will you ensure that Guelph will be a favorable choice for new tech sector businesses to locate to? Well, that's a pretty uh, good question. We, we've already trying to put a plan into action, as, uh, and, uh, provided we get elected. We need more industry. Uh, we've, we've been, if you look at Cambridge, you look at Kitchener and Waterloo, and even look at Wellington County, why did they get all the industry? Now, the high-tech industry is good, clean, taxable uh, properties, and we're after that, and we're going to be with a representative from Guelph, we're going to change some of the rules and get some of that into Guelph. It's a matter of working with the city and having some connections at, at the provincial level to get those industries. Thank you, Ray. Uh, Sly, over to you. I, I, think, uh, I think that Guelph is the place to, to, to come. I don't feel, or, you know, I may be misreading this, but I don't think that Guelph is is suffering. But I understand that the uh, 
the uh, we want to attract more and more. But I think that this is a this is a job that would require um, both levels, municipal and provincial, to work together to make things uh, more attractive. But the way people are moving into this community, I think everybody wants to be here. So I'm not sure we're going to need to do that much of a sales job, to be honest. Thank you. Okay. Mike, over to you. So one of the things that excites me most about being Guelph's MPP is to being a champion to, for Guelph to be the North American leader in clean innovation, clean tech, and the new economy. I want to skate to where the puck is going, not where it's been. I want to build on what's already here. We have the largest solar manufacturer in Canada. We have the largest geothermal distributor in North America in Guelph. We have five or six green building builders uh, building new generation homes in Guelph. We have vertical farms like Molly's Vertical Farm here in Guelph. That kind of innovation is one of the reasons Guelph is such a great place to invest and live. I want to champion that, and I think if we want to tell the world that Guelph is the place to invest in clean innovation, let's elect Ontario's first green MPP to be that champion. Great. Okay, Agnieszka, over to you. Yes, uh, we agree with Mike in, in some senses on this. Uh, the innovation in the manufacturing sector of Guelph is exciting. Uh, Linamar is developing new fuel cell technology. Uh, Canadian solar is ever expanding and growing because this is a future business that is only going to grow and become more popular. Uh, we totally agree with this as well and we also recognize though that there is a gap uh, in our skilled labor force and we need to support our university and colleges in addressing this so we have a labor force that's effective and exciting for manufacturers and innovators and startups to come and take advantage of and that's why we want to begin to see those un those freezes end on universities the uh, so they can put the funding towards where they want to see it grow to where they need to need to help those jobs uh, and help those graduates to get those jobs. In addition, we really need to have that all day, two way go if we want to be the effective innovation center uh, that we can be. Thank you, Agnieszka. Rebuttal, I see from, uh, from Ray, over to you. Yes, those are all good points, but uh, you must be aware of the, uh, of the effect of industry and businesses coming into Guelph. Guelph has the worst ratio of taxation. We've got houses paying $5,000 a year taxes and that's because we have 86 percent residential we only have 14 percent of industrial and commercial this is what you have to understand it if, if we become a total bedroom city you won't be able to afford to live in guelph a lot of people now the the, the thing is people from guelph can't afford the taxes because of the imbalance they're moving to Fergus and Alora in paris and the toronto people are coming here it is not good to be a total bedroom city Thank you, Ray. Okay, seeing no rebuttal plaques up, we will move on to our last question before we move into closing statements. Um, what is your party's position, and this will we'll start with you, Mike. What is your party's position on the basic income pilot project? So the Green Party has long advocated for a basic income guarantee. I think we live in a changing economy where we have more precarious work, more temporary work, uh, more freelance work, more people becoming their own individual entrepreneurs. And in order to make sure that we can move forward without anybody falling through the cracks, we need a basic income guarantee. And so I was so happy to see the Liberal government bring forward the pilot project but we can't allow that to be an excuse not to address extreme poverty right now. And so that is why we are calling for raising social assistance rates for all people on Ontario Works and Ontario Disability Support to the level of the basic income pilot. And we have a fiscal plan to pay for by cancelling the unfair hydro plan. We, by the end of our four years, have a plan in place to roll out a full basic income so nobody falls through the cracks in Ontario. That's good for our Thank communities you, and our economy. Thank you, Mike. That is time on that question. Ray, over to you. Well, we feel that the, our, our, the PC system of putting money and letting you decide where, where, where you want to live and what you can afford, we we're, we're really feel that I've talked to enough people Low-cost housing, rental housing is the key to get everybody back on, 
on their own feet. And that's one of the things that we're going to spend a lot of time and energy in doing it quickly. But as far as the social projects, uh, the programs, we feel really if you give people a decent place to live and give them some training for a job, they, they, can, they can work as long as their expenses of the hydro net are controlled. Right. Okay. Uh, we will move next to Agnieszka. Uh, we support the basic income pilot project as set forth by the Liberals. We're looking forward to expanding it as well and continuing to invest in it because it is a worthy cause. Uh, furthermore, we also want to see increases to ODSP by 5% for the next three years as well because we recognize with inflation this program has kind of fallen on the back burner. In addition, we firmly believe in 15 and fairness. Whether you're a student or a server, you deserve to make $15 an hour. But I also want to look at the idea of having benefits, of looking after those 4 million people who don't have those and who work full-time jobs, whether it be temporary, precarious, or three part-time jobs to make things happen. That will help with bills that will help individuals uh, to be able to move forward if they are looked after. And that's why we want to cover 125 of the most essential medications and push pharmacare for all and see dental coverage for all as well. Thank you, Agnieszka. And Sly, over to you. Yeah, we're very excited about that basic uh, income uh, project and we look forward to having the results of it. I think that um, the issue of poverty and social services and supports is a lot more complicated and I think that that system needs a complete overhaul in terms of how, th how it plays out on the ground level. But uh, in terms of the basic income pilot, I think that that was a good thing, it was the good direction and we need as a, as a province to deal with the issue of poverty. Thank you. All right. Uh seeing the rebuttal plaques up, uh, which we uh, thought we might see. Um, we have time for another question. This will be our last question prior to closing statements. Sly, you will begin this uh, particular question. What is your position on the closing of the sheltered workshops? And if elected, will you and your party commit to reopen the issue and engage in genuine discussion with families and advocates? Um, thank you for that question, and, and yes, if, if elected, I'm, I'm completely open to meeting with the folks around the sheltered workshops. I think that uh, this is a, it's a difficult issue, and I, I think that we can come up with some very creative solutions in moving forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we will move to you, Mike. Yeah, I think the Liberal government made a huge mistake closing the sheltered workshops. And I've spoken with so many parents here in Guelph. Um, I don't know if any of you saw the demonstration that took place in front of Liz Handel's office a few weeks ago. But families are hurting, and individuals with developmental disabilities are hurting because they've lost the place they go to for community, for meaningful work. And so we do need to reopen them. We do need to reopen them, though, in ways that look at um, how you repay the individuals participating in the program to make sure it's fair. And we also need to make sure there are choices for full integration into the workplace. I can tell you when I ran my small business, we worked with community living to bring adults with developmental disabilities to work in our company, and it was rewarding for our business and it was rewarding for the individuals who participated Thank in the workplace. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Ray, over to you. I've met with a bunch, uh, a large group of parents. I've toured their facilities just on to try to get up the steam. It is probably the most sickening thing I've ever seen that the government would take this away from these handicapped people. And it's all to do with that Bill 148, where, you, where they wouldn't allow any uh, volunteers or, or part-time people without giving them full benefits. It's, it, really, it really made me sad that they could write a letter to that and say, we're gonna treat you all equally and your funding is finished. I think that's deplorable. And if we get in, that'll be re rescinded very quickly. Thank you, Ray. Agnieszka. Uh, we, are, we are willing to look into it. Uh, however, we stand firmly and believe that a minimum wage is a minimum wage, and everybody deserves to make $15 an hour, uh, whatever, whatever your situation or status may be. Uh, we also believe that this is not the only barrier that we're seeing. IOTA or the, 
is not working. And it's because the people are having so much access, so much barriers to access of education to the job market, because IOTA hasn't been followed through in the last 15 years, that we also need to address this. Because there's currently a $25 billion loss to our economy, because individuals uh, who are differently abled are unable to access the resources that they need to be able to get the jobs that they want and to be able to get the education they deserve as well. So I think overall we need to look at the system and evaluate, evaluate it completely um, and move forward with implementing IOTA properly, a failure of Thank the last you, 15 Agnieszka. years. We're pressed for time, Sly. We won't go on rebuttals. We will um, start our closing statements uh, and we will go in reverse order from how we began. So, uh, Ray, we'll start with you for closing statements for a minute and a half. Yes, thank you. Uh, this has been an eye-opening uh, trip for me so far. I spent a, a, a one, one day in London at a think tank for new candidates, and I was very, very impressed with the uh, acumen and the experience from a lot of the existing liberals, uh, excuse me, the existing, <laughs> the existing conservatives uh, who, are, who are very, very in tune with what's going on at, the, uh, at Queen's Park. They're very intelligent, Christine Elliott, uh, a lot of other people, they have a lot of experience, and I feel that we are one of the parties, if not the only one, that could hit the ground running with a tremendous group of people. It's not just one person, it's a group, and, it's, uh, and, and we will work as a team, and I, I can see nothing but benefits for that. So you have to be very careful who you vote for. I mean, everybody promises the moon and the sun, like the tri Tribune said today. But you have to be able to have the party and the authority to carry it out. Thank you, Ray. Mike, over to you. So this is clearly a change election. The people of Ontario want change. The question is, do we want change that reflects our values of the community or change that's going to take us backwards? Do we want to leap into the future and embrace it, or do we want to step backwards to the past? Do we want to vote for cuts to public services, or do we want to invest in our community and build it up? I'm fighting for change that builds Guelph up. I'm fighting for change that builds a bridge to the future that we can walk across with compassion and confidence and make sure we leave a livable future for our children. And so, so many people have said, you know, I sometimes feel I have to vote out of fear. Well, I'm asking you in this election to vote for hope. Because if you continue to elect politicians that don't reflect your values, we'll never have a government that reflects the province that you want. And so I'm asking you in this election to embrace hope for the future. And together, let's make history. Let's send Ontario's first green MPP to Queen's Park. Let's change politics forever in this province and make it about putting people first and planet first. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Sly, over to you. Thank you. Thank you for all your questions and for being engaged in this democratic process. Um, and I hope that through these last couple of hours, you, had, you got a better idea of who we are. For me, I'm clear about why I want to represent this riding. I want to make a difference in the lives of the people, and I think Guelph is an amazing community, and I want to ensure our continued growth and prosperity. We all have platforms. And if you go on our sites, you can read them all out. They've all been costed. They are thoughtful. They are planned. The question is, which one best meets your needs, and who among us do you want to send to represent those needs? I think it's interesting when we talk about change because up here, all of us are different except for Mike. So what is it the kind of change that we're asking for, right? And I think that it's important for people to understand this is an important election. We have a lot at stake. We run the risk of losing a lot, not out of fear, out of understanding, because of the platforms and what they've committed to. I have experience in this community. I, I, I am an advocate of heart. I'm hard.